Manchester, Tennessee is going to be the glad recipients of some of our members uh, for next Sunday. By the time, we appreciate your service, you and your wife's service to our Lord here. What a blessing. What a blessing. <laughs> Last Sunday, I think they're going to be with us on Wednesday night. But please let them know how much you love them in the Lord. Also, we have a good report from Belgium to give you this morning. Brother Mickle has already had service today. He called me early this morning. Uh, he's baptized three converts this week. And uh, he was looking forward to that. They had Bible school. Their highs, uh, they, went, they went from 35 to 40 all week in Bible school. And they had two families to join last Sunday. And I believe they had one couple that was, uh, two of the three that were baptized baptized were husband and wife. And so he's just really elated this morning. He wanted to send word to the Mother Church here, Temple Baptist Church. Thank you for your faithful giving above your tithes to missions. That's what we do with it. We send missionaries. And Brother Mickle is one who is sponsored right out of our church. Isn't that good news? Thought you'd like to hear that. Amen. Our text verse this morning is verse number 23 of chapter 4 of the book of Proverbs. Keep thine heart. It's a command of the Lord to keep or guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Great verse, great, great verse. Uh, uh, the very essence of our life is summarized in this one verse. And we need to pay attention this morning. We need to pay close attention because some people, you know, they, they, they let their guard down. They, they don't keep their heart as they should. And uh, tragedy happens. And uh, the devil sneaks in. He's very subtle. And he knows exactly. You know, he knows human nature. That the last 6,000 years he's been studying human nature, uh, and he knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows when we're weak, and he can take advantage of you. Be sober, be vigilant, very uh, vigilant, the scripture says, for your adversary, the devil, is as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So the world says it this way. The world says, take it easy. Uh, it just says, uh, you know, uh, take thine ease, eat and drink, for tomorrow we shall die. Let's party, let's have a carnival, let's have a festival, let all your barriers down, let all your inhibitions down, and just blend in, just have a big old time. God says just the opposite. Don't let your guard down. Don't let your barriers down. Satan will sneak in when you do. Don't get weakened in the flesh. Uh, don't give in to the flesh. Uh, in other words, uh, just the opposite, God says in 2 Corinthians 6, 17, he makes this bold statement, Wherefore, come out from among the world, and be a separate people, a holy people, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. He also says in verse 17, or 14 of the same chapter, Be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. Doesn't mean you can't reach out to them and try to win them, try to influence them, try to persuade them. But what it's saying is, uh, you be careful who you associate with. But why? Because you become who you associate with. Be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? So in order to keep you from sliding back, God says, in order from you, for you to keep from uh, following the narrow path that we've heard this morning, in order for you to stay on that straight and narrow path that the Lord would have you on, you're going to have to keep your guard up. You're going to have to keep your heart. You're going to have to take the shield of faith to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Do you put on the whole armor of God when you walk outside your house? You're an easy target for the devil if you don't guard your heart. You need to keep the good fight of faith going. You need to stand fast in the Lord. The Bible says be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, 16, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked ones. Amen. Parents, you want your children uh, to be the very best Christian that they can be. You want them to have soundness of speaking and of thinking. Well, you have to provide for them wholesome, healthy activities and inter interaction with other people, you see. And provide for them a fellowship of believers, basically, who are living that good life for the Lord. Why? So important to be around the right kind of people. I'm so glad it's Sunday. I'm so glad I'm in church, aren't you? 
I'm so glad I'm associated with a good godly church that's doing the right things in their life. No, we're not any better than anybody else. We're not trying to say that or imply that in any way, shape, or form. But what we're saying is we're pleading for the mercies and the kindness of God. I wish you could have been here on Saturday morning to heard those men, especially towards the 5 o'clock hour, pleading for God and crying out to God in a great way. It was unusual. And I love those kind of meetings. Uh, I love hearing people uh, cry out to God. Why? Because you hear the most inner, uh, you hear the, the, uh, the, the, the groanings uh, of the most inner parts of a person's heart and soul when they're crying out to God like this in a prayer meeting. But uh, you know what I believe? I, bet I believe between a good church and a good Christian home, uh, your home life is most important. You know one of the greatest mission fields in America is the Christian home. We need to take care. We need to guard what we watch. We need to guard what we uh, allow in our homes. We need good godly homes. Amen. We need Christian homes. We need Christian churches. We need good Christian schools. I believe we have one of the best ones anywhere that can be found. Uh, I appreciate our Christian school. I appreciate all of our good Christian teachers that you're even here this morning. And they're preparing their hearts. They're studying to give something back to our students. You know why? They have strength from God. They have the love of God to give out. And I love the Christian testimony. Brother Andre up here giving a testimony about hey, how he's seen all these people uh, come through and now they're graduated and uh, how they uh, got children of their own come to the Christian school. And uh, he's done that because he's been here 20 long years. He's been right here at Temple Baptist and Temple Christian Academy all these many years. What we believe here is that uh, two are better than one and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. You get a good Christian home, you get a good Christian school and a Christian church all working, intertwined together, it'd be hard for the devil to break that. I'm talking about a connection with God, a connection with godly people, and we believe our resolve to train our children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord should not be broken. Amen. We should give due uh, diligence to making sure a resilience, a resolve on our part, if you will, a concentrated effort in training our young people to serve the Lord. This next Friday night, I don't care what's going on, if it's movie night or bowling night, uh, if it's, uh, you, you know, canoe clubbing or whatever you're doing Friday night, cancel it. Your young people are more important to hear the man of God and to be here at this youth rally. 20 plus churches are going to be here. I implore you as Temple Baptist Church and Christian parents to have your young people here. Bring them if they're, if they're hollering and scratching and fussing and cussing. If you have to, bring them all. God has the remedy pill for them. They, they'll leave uh, frowning. They'll, 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 uh, they'll come frowning. They'll leave smiling. Praise the Lord. The Bible teaches us to keep our heart with all diligence. Now, we're going to have to train our young people to do that because some of us, even as adults, haven't learned to master this just yet. <laughs> Amen. We're still having trouble. Does anybody have trouble with those three feet like I do? Man, I'm telling you, he gives me a hard time. And don't ever think that this, that, that uh, you know, you get a monopoly on this. Just about the time that you think that, uh, uh, you know, that you, you're mastering the Christian life, uh, you know who slips up behind you. You have to be ready for it. You have to prepare your heart. Amen. You have to prepare your heart and keep it with all your diligence. Number one, the word keep comes into mind. It has the meaning to guard. It has, the, uh, it has this meaning, uh, if you will, uh, to imagine not to do evil. We should guard what we listen to. We should guard what we look at. Job 31 and 1, it says, I made a covenant with mine eyes. I made a covenant with mine eyes. That means that I'm making an oath to the Lord that I'm not going to look on that which brings reproach. I'm not going to look upon that which would make me lust. I'm not going to look upon uh, the opposite sex and, uh, and to think on this person as a, uh, a person that I should lust after. No, no. Our eyes are inlets to our soul. Listen to Peter when he says in 1 Peter 2 and 11, Dearly beloved, Talking to Christians now, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from lusty, uh, fleshly lust which war against the soul. The battleground is your mind, amen? <laughs> These thoughts that you have, you have to take full control 
over them. Listen to 2 Corinthians 10 and 5. Casting down imaginations and every, uh, the Bible says, every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. And bring it in into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. One might say, Pastor, it is utterly impossible to bring every thought into captivity. Yes, what's impossible with man is possible with God. You have his word on it that you can take these thoughts into control. You have to gain control of your thought life. You have to have power with God as you go out every day while the devil is laying traps and snares for you. He wants you out of church. He wants you out of the will of God just like he has captured so many others. He's very good at it. So we must keep, and this word keep has the meaning, we must keep and guard our heart. Would you agree with the Apostle Peter that we're in warfare? We're in warfare over our members of our body? The Bible says very clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 9 that we're not our own, that we've been purchased or bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. One may say, preacher, I'm my own boss. I can do what I want to. I'm an adult now, and I can do with my body as I please to do with my body. If you're a Christian, that's wrong because the scripture says you're not your own. You are the Lord Jesus. He's yours and, and you're his. And you've entrusted into his care your life, your body, your mind, your soul. We're to love the Lord, how? With all of our mind, body, soul, and strength. This is the great commandment, isn't it? Are you keeping your mind and your heart for the Lord? Are you allowing the Lord to lead your life in such a uh, a way in which you would be, bring no reproach upon the name of our God or the name of this church. I hope that you would do that. We would all agree this morning that we have the problems in this life as a result of not fighting the good fight of faith. I mean, every problem that we have stem initially from this one point of something evil entering our heart. When lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death and destruction. So we have to stand guard. We know huh, what the final outcome. We know where that leads us to. We know that road is not leading us towards God. It's leading us away from the Lord. So stand guard over your heart. Men, stand guard over your children and your wives. Oh, yes. And as pastor, I must stand guard over this flock. Yes, there were some that would sneak in like grievous wolves and fleece the flock, not sparing the flock of God. Yep. I must have my, uh, my, uh, uh, my uh, what do you call this little uh, king? The shepherds kick around. I must take the staff of God's word and drive away those grievous wolves, amen, sometimes. Because they're here to devour. They're here to take advantage uh, of innocent people and would hurt innocent people. But the sake and the grace of God, if God wasn't here and his power wasn't here, Satan could get in. Aren't you thankful for the power of the Lord? Praise God. We must be diligent in protecting our heart and our children's hearts, the emotional baggage that would follow you from this day forward can be avoided if we would only but keep our heart. I'm talking about emotional scarring. I'm talking about psychological uh, problems, mental breakdowns, yea, even. All due to the fact that we did not keep and guard our heart. That's where it all begins. I'm telling you something that the psychologists can't tell you because they don't know about this part, part of the anatomy. <laughs> they don't want to recognize the spiritual aspect of man. But I'm telling you, there's a part of you and every one of us, there's a part of us that is there to serve and to worship the true God of heaven. Amen. When we do not do this, there's a void and there's an emptiness in our life. Keep your heart. Number two, and notice how we're to keep it with all diligence. I like that. We're to give all diligence to keeping our heart. Ecclesiastes 9 and 10, it says, Whatsoever thy hand finds thee do, do it with thy might. 
Do it with all of your might. We must give our life to this cause of protecting our heart. What some uh, think that is not very much to it, it's a lot to it. <laughs> we must put emphasis behind this. We must stress this to our young people to keep their hearts and their minds pure. We must uh, keep the heart of our children and our family members. We must teach them how to resist Satan. Listen to James 4 and 7. The Bible says, Submit yourselves therefore to God and resist the devil and he will flee from you. I believe the Bible. How about you? This word resist is not a passive term, no. It is a military verbiage here. It means to resist. Resist here means to fight with all your might. Whatever you have to do to shoot him off and resist him. We plead the blood of Jesus over our homes, do we not? We ask God's power over our homes. Why? Because we know that Satan is after the homes. This morning we were on our bus and we were traveling to church and we were watching how many families were all uh, ready for church and they were riding to church together. We were seeing that as we were coming to church and it was a thrill to our heart to see this because so few families today are really making much of Jesus and making much of his church and making much of keeping their hearts. They think they can just go by week after week after week without really preparing their heart. And exercising faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and resisting the devil. They think that they can outmatch the devil. Can I tell you this morning, you're no match for the devil. Brother, he can take you and he can, he, he can literally tear you up. And uh, your, your family life and your home life can be divided in such a way uh, in so many different directions that uh, you wish a thousand times that you had just done what the scripture said uh, to begin with. And that is to keep and to guard your heart with all diligence. We must keep our heart. We must stay in the word of God. So how do we keep our heart past? We must have the mind of God. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus our Lord. Philippians 2 and 5. We need the mind of Jesus Christ. Amen. We must have strong leaders leading their families. I'll tell you what we really need. We need some general, generational warriors. They'll say by the grace of God, uh, uh, my family was not Christian or my, uh, my previous uh, heritage was not Christian, but this is the first generation and by God's grace, there's going to be many more after me that believe in Jesus Christ and follow his will for their life. You ought to make that decision this morning, men, that you're going to be the leader of your home and you're going to be here to represent your family every time this church doors are open. During this revival service this week, you're not going to miss a service. Yeah. Didn't get many amens right there. Men, I say I need your help this week. I want you here representing your family, not missing a service of the revival. Can I hear a hearty amen right there? Yeah. Why, wow, we have a real live devil out there. We have spiritual warfare going on. We think we're going to get by just to, the way we are and we're okay. I hear so many people say, Preacher, I'm all right. I'm good. I think to myself, if only they knew, if only they could see themselves the way that God sees them, they wouldn't say that. The Bible says, For none are good, no, not one. The Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I don't know about you, Christian, but I'm in a constant state of repentance in my life. I think wrong, I act wrong, I say wrong, I, I'm confessing to you, and I know if you're a good Christian this morning, you're not trying to, uh, to, to hide things in your life and say, Hey, everything's okay. No, everything's not okay. That's why we need church. That's why we need one another. That's why we need to be in a good soul winning station every week seeing people saved and baptized and added to the church fellowship. We need each other more than we think we do. We resist the devil. Pray tell me how you're going to resist the devil with the sheets over your head and your pillow over your head on Sunday morning. You're not going to resist him. He's on you in a New York second. Amen. Hey, there's too many of us that's fallen in the battle already. I have too many of my friends that have fallen victim and prey to the devil. I'm sick and tired of that. I want revival in my generation. I want this church to be as full as it was last Sunday morning. Where's the rest of it? 
Would you call that person, if you really care about them and their family, would you call that person that usually sits next to you when you get home? Would you do your pastor a favor? Would you help me out? I need a lot of helpers. I need a lot of helpers. Why? Too many are falling, falling victim in this battle. We need reinforcements. We need recruits. We need volunteers for Jesus Christ. Amen. We're a Christian army. You know that? We're soldiers. And the Bible teaches us to, en to endure hardness as good soldiers of Jesus Christ. It gets hard, doesn't it? Let me tell you what happens when the going gets tough. The tough just keep on going. The Christian, the Christian army just keep on marching and marching and hook two, three, four, hook two, three, four, hook two, three, four, hook two, three, four. I'm asking a question today. What tune are you marching to? What army are you marching with? Are you marching for the cause of Christ? Do you know how important this is to keep our hearts in tune and in unity with one another to have the love of Jesus Christ in our heart when we walk through those doors and not be so cold and callous? You know, we can even come to church and really just hear uh, doing it out of, uh, you know, mechanical, just doing it out because we're always doing it. Friend, we need to come in the spirit of the Lord. We need to come prayed up. We need to come believing that God's going to do something special today. We need to come believing that God's going to save some souls today. We need to come believing that God has something very special for, for us to hear here this morning. It's not just another Sunday. It's not just taking up some more time. Friend, we are in warfare. May I repeat to you, we are in Christian warfare. Amen. Amen. I want to say number three and lastly. Why are we keeping our heart with all diligence? Why? Because for out of it are the issues of life. I'm talking about the kind of life that you enjoy or be miserable in. Either one. It's your choice. <laughs> I heard a man tell me on the phone yesterday, he said, Pastor, for 11 years I've been a miserable creature. Can you imagine being miserable for 11 long years of your life? What is that? The joy of the Lord is our strength. We must, every day, we must die to ourselves and crucify this old carnal flesh. You know what some people are saying? I've heard people say it this way. Pastor, I'm having issues. Have y'all ever heard anything, anybody say that? You know what they're really trying to say? They're really trying to say that they didn't keep their heart. And because they didn't keep their heart, the Bible says out of it are the issues of life. Out of it are, are, are miserable things that have come because they didn't keep their heart like they should have. That's what they're really trying to say. Amen. Did you know Rehoboam did evil because he did not prepare his heart to seek the Lord? That's 2 Chronicles 12, 14. Did you know the good hand of God was upon Ezra? It says, because for Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to teach in Israel statutes and judgment, Ezra 7 and 10. Did you know in Acts chapter 1 and verse number 1, it says, the former trees have I made, O Theopolis, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Now, we need, to, need you to teach. We have many teachers here. We have teachers in the college. We have teachers in the school. We have teachers in uh, Sunday school. Uh, we have teachers in the t uh, children's church and the teen church and the toddler church going on while we're in here. Wonderful. But, you know, uh, more importantly than, than, than you teaching is to practice what you teach and preach. Jesus it said of him that he both began to, both to do and to teach. It's wonderful to teach, but more importantly, to do what you're teaching. You see? Why? One without the other is pointless. Our students and our children are smart enough to see through all that charade. If we're just sitting there teaching them and we don't mean what we're teaching, and our heart is really not in it, that's why I prefer the Christian education, because they should have the heart and mind of God when they're teaching, and they're keeping their heart with all diligence. The teachers are. And we handpick these people and we've trained these people and we love these people and we know who they are. And this church has the authority over those teachers to live right and to walk right. And if they don't, we check them. We make sure they're doing so. We get somebody else in there that will follow the Lord. They don't have no union around here, by the way. Amen. The only union is that book right there. If 
They don't live up to that book right there. Uh, just like your pastor, if, if I fall into moral uh, problems or heretical problems, this church is obligated to check me. If I'm preaching to you, and when I preach to you on Sunday, if you can't find it in the Bible, something's going south in my preaching, it's your duty as a, a body of believers to say, hey, preacher, that wasn't thus saith the Lord. We must believe the word of God is our final, excuse me, our sole authority on everything we do here. Thank God we have the authority of God's word to preach and to baptize and to teach the converts that come down this aisle. Praise God for that. Did you know we have a whole lot less problems when we prepare our heart to do uh, what it is that we're to do here? And, and to practice and to perform and to publish that which we're doing? So nobody's really going to believe you. Okay, you can say a lot of things. Hey, preacher, I'm with you. Talk's cheap. Uh, you know, uh, I'll be here for the revival. I'll do this. I'll do that. Hey, but the, the matter is, are we going to do what we're saying we're going to do? One thing to say you believe, but another thing, hey, <clears throat> we make a wide, well, worldwide circulation of talk, but talk's not going to get the job done. We must believe with all of our heart what we're teaching is the emphatic word of God. We must believe that it has the power to change lives. We must believe the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. The word of God is powerful. It's God's word that saves souls. We must preach the word of God. Praise God every morning we have a Bible class for every one of our students. The very first class of the day, before they learn reading, before they learn writing, before they uh, learn arithmetic, praise God, amen, they learn the precious word of God. Amen. We have chapels three each week of our students. They come uh, elementary, junior high, high school. High school gets three a week. You know, our high school needs more. Amen. Junior high gets two a week. Elementary get one a week. You see, as the older we get, the more we need of the Word of God. Preacher, I'm too big for Sunday school. If you're too big of bitches for Sunday school, friend, you don't understand the problem. The problem is, if Satan can get you to fall, he can cause your children to fall. He can cause your grandchildren to fall. He can keep a whole generation from going to heaven. We must keep our heart with all diligence. Did you know that Paul the Apostle knew that he could fall? That's why he said in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, but I keep under my body and break it, bring it into subjection lest uh, that it, by any means while I preach to others that I myself should become a castaway. He declared his weakness before all. He, didn't, he wasn't one of these kind of people who said, hey, you know what, I'll never fall. I'm strong. I never, I never will fall into this problem. No, 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 no. No, he admitted he was weak. And Christians, we need to admit, admit that we're weak. We need to admit that we need Christ. We need his word. We need church. We need the fellowship of believers or else we will fall out. Amen. Else we will become a, another statistic and tragedy. Listen to Romans 7, 23. Paul also said, I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity, the law of sin which is in my members. He said, oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? He knew the struggle. He knew the problem. He knew there were situations in his life that he was not pleased with, but he had to plead to God. He had to keep his heart every day, every moment of the day. We must stay on guard, on point. Amen. And if we're going to win this battle for our mind, for our body, and in our spirit, walking in the spirit of the Lord each day, we're going to have to keep our heart with all diligence. For out of it are the issues of life. The Bible is true. It's not going to go away, is it? And so the very existence of our life is in jeopardy if we do not live according to this verse. In closing, let me read the last two verses of this chapter once and again. Ponder the path of thy feet. Okay, where have you been going? What you been doing? What you been involved with? Ponder the path of thy feet and let all thy ways be established. Last verse. Turn not to the right hand, nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. Keep thine heart. Why? Because what we're thinking, what we're imagining, what we have uh, visions of doing in our mind, these thoughts, maybe they're good, maybe they're bad. Did you know what we're thinking? As it, the Bible teaches us this one main principle. 
as a man thinketh in his heart. You see, Christianity is a heart matter. For with a heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with a mouth confession is made unto salvation. Christianity is a heart matter. It's a heart matter. Keep thine heart. Christian, if you're saved by God's grace, keep in mind you have two natures. You can revert back to the old world, to the old ways in which God saved you from, real quickly. That's why we have to keep our heart. Keep it with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Let's bow our heads, shall we? Father, thank you.